it can be funny, it can be terrifying, it can be exciting, it, it can be almost any programme it wants to be. I mean, there are some truly terrible ones. <laughs> there are some uh, someone should never choose. How do you feel about making Billy Piper cry? Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> terrible man. Hello, and welcome to The Best Ever a new series from Radio Times, where we tackle the questions keeping TV and film fans up at night. Who is fiction's most brilliant crime solver? Which fantasy series casts the most powerful spell? And which rom-com has won the most hearts? I'm Morgan Jeffrey, executive editor at RadioTimes.com, and I'm joined by a panel of pop culture enthusiasts for a good-natured war of words. Each of our guests has come armed with an opinion, and their job is to convince me that their pick, and only theirs, deserves the title of the best ever. Our chosen topic for this episode will take us across all of time and space as we crown the best ever Doctor Who story. Joining us on the panel are Nicholas Briggs, actor, writer, creative director, and executive producer at Big Finish, Voice of the Daleks, Cybermen, and many more. Beth Axford, author, digital creator, and Doctor Who superfan, and Louise Griffin, RadioTimes.com's sci-fi and fantasy editor. Thank you all. For joining us. Nick, welcome to the best ever. Uh, Doctor Who has been on the air for 60 years, uh, mm. but why do you think has it stood the test of time? <laughs> it's an well, easy one. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll with. just solve that. <laughs> yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Um, because it changes and evolves. You know, if, you, if a program stays uh, the same, people will get tired of it. And the advantage with Doctor Who, and I just feel like I'm saying the things that everyone's said before, not here, but in the world, uh, that it's changes built into the format of Doctor Who. Even before they realized they could regenerate the Doctor into someone with a different face, you know, they can go anywhere and any time and meet any kind of person. Mm. So it, it can be funny, it can be terrifying, it can be exciting, it, it can be almost any programme it wants to be, and that's why it's survived. Mm. Also, it's brilliant. Yeah, that, that is key. Yeah. That is key. <laughs> <laughs> and Beth, for you, what was your earliest uh, Doctor Who memory and what was it that gripped you about the show? Yeah, so my first memory of Doctor Who is at the end, you know, at the end of Aliens of London. Mm. Um, <laughs> where, uh, so young. Sorry to say. Um, <laughs> where the Slovene pins one of the politicians high up against the wall. Yeah. And I was a very small child and I was like, oh my God, what is this? And then I promptly forgot about it and didn't come back to it for like a few, you know, a few weeks with the regeneration. But yeah. that was my very, that's the earliest thing I can remember. Yeah. But, you were probably oh. traumatised after that. You were too scared to come back. I think I just, honestly, I don't remember my feelings, but then I remember seeing the regeneration and then my little brain getting obsessed. And then mm. I forgot about it again until the beginning of series two, mm. when I saw a sticker book in a newsagent's and I convinced my mother to buy it for me. And then for somehow that's what got me back into it. The sticker so, books, oh. it was all about the sticker. <laughs> yeah. You've stuck with it ever since. Yeah. <laughs> Louise, again, yeah. 60 years worth of Doctor Who, without giving it away, how difficult was it to pick just one story as the best ever? It was so difficult. I mean, like Nick said, it's it's been, changing for years and years and i think that was part of what made it so difficult like there are so many stories that are so different mm. but all with so much heart there are i mean there are some truly terrible ones <laughs> there are some uh, someone should never choose i <laughs> but the majority mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh nick what have you done the majority i think are absolutely brilliant and even even classic versus new who like mm. where do you even go i mm. do think i've chosen the best episode though so now, of course, we have classic who, new who, and potentially new new who. Yeah. I don't know. We need. I think we need a new terminology. I'm not sure exactly what we're, <laughs> what we're calling yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, today's winner doesn't just win my approval. They will also get their hands on our best ever trophy. I feel like the tension in the room has just gone, gone up a notch. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, uh, let's get into it. Nick, in your opinion, yes. I'm starting with you, I'm afraid. Oh, what I knew it. is the best ever Doctor Who story? Well, controversially... I don't think there is a best ever Doctor Who story in the general sense. It's fine, stop, stop recording. We're still done. <laughs> we done. I've broken the format. <laughs> you see, I've done a Doctor Who thing. You see, I've changed the program. I think the best ever Doctor Who story. I mean, for me, it all it changes almost every day. So. Mm. What I'm naming here... I feel like there's a lot of preamble, so I'm really <laughs> intrigued as to what you're going to pick. Well, what I'm naming here is a story that many people think is one of the worst Doctor Who stories, okay. uh, which is uh, a 1974 John Pertwee story called Death to the Daleks. 
It's a wild card, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> why, why? Is that one of the terrible ones? Uh, I'll let you explain. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Why death to the Daleks? For completely illogical mm. reasons. Um, you know, as you know, I've spent a lot of my life doing audio Doctor Who. And one of the reasons that that was possible, and one of the reasons why I think it's popular, audio Doctor Who, whereas audio other franchises doesn't, often doesn't quite catch the audience's imagination is because a lot of us older fans, we used to tape record Doctor Who off the telly because there were no domestic video recorders of any kind. Which is why there's so many of the missing episodes still available as audio. Exactly, exactly. Now, in 1973, I really became obsessed with wanting to hear the Doctor Who theme all the time. And before it occurred to me that I could go to a record shop and buy the records, which I didn't even know existed until after an episode of Doctor Who, they said, the Doctor Who theme is also available. <laughs> you know, uh, I, um, I used to, so I set up the tape recorder to record the opening and closing theme of Doctor Who. Mm. And I didn't, um, I didn't stop it soon enough after the opening theme. And I used to start it early before the closing theme in case, because you never quite knew where the cliffhanger was coming. Mm. And uh, I found I started listening to the little bits of Frontier in Space uh, more than the theme. So I thought, the next time the Daleks are on, I'll record mm. that. Well, the next story was Planet of the Daleks. I wasn't ready with the tape stock. Mm. So I waited until the next year. <laughs> I had enough tape to record th uh, three episodes. Yeah. And so uh, and I knew about Death to the Daleks because the BBC Radio Time special Nice. for the first time ever, told us what was coming up for the whole of the next year. Yeah. I mean, amazing. That had never happened before. So I was ready for death to the Daleks. I thought, I won't record the first episode because the Daleks are never in the first They turn up at the end of episode they one, turn, always. And sure it, enough. Exactly. Yeah. What happened? I thought, ha ha. <laughs> so I have listened to death to the Daleks yeah. over and over again. And consequently, it feels the most Doctor who -y thing ever. Mm. And I think I learned all my ideas about how Doctor Who works, uh, uh, how a story progresses and how it sounds, even though it sounds quite unique and weird. What can I tell you about it? If you don't know, it's a story where Terry Nation every year kept allegedly delivering the same story. He's the creator of the Daleks, the writer, in case you didn't know. And um, he thought it, he always thinks of a little uh, hook to make things different for the Daleks. So the previous year, there were Daleks that were invisible. This year, he decided there'd be Daleks who'd lost the power to kill people. Mm. So the Doctor and co arrive on a planet, well, Doctor and Sarah arrive on a planet where there's a big beacon that drains all the power and the Daleks are helpless. The people there are helpless. They're trying to find a, uh, a life-saving mineral to cure a space plague, which is ravaging the galaxy. And they have to work together. And you know that the Daleks, although they agree to work with the humans, you know they're just going to betray them. Mm. And you have a sort of human traitor in there who decides it's a really good idea to subjugate the inhabitants of the planet. You see, this is a really rich story. And the brilliant thing about it is it would make a great movie. Mm. There are loads and loads of things wrong with it, mm. you know? <laughs> Remember, uh, this, is, this is the best effort. This yeah, is, this I know. Is this but, is your choice. But, is... I'm, but I love the things that are wrong with it as well, yeah. because they... And in what's, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? In some people's view, they yeah. don't like the incidental music by a mm. composer called Carrie Blyton and mm. the, what is it, the London Saxophone Quartet. Mm. And so when the Daleks come on, it's this rather cutie theme. Of... <laughs> But they put ring modulation on it, which yeah. is the effects that you put on a Dalek voice. So it's sort of saxophones that have been Dalekized. Mm. And, and it, I, I love the music yeah. of Death of the Dalek. I hate Dalek saxophones. I mean. Well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and a lot of people, um, you know, criticize the Dalek voices. And they're by Michael Wisher, who mm. the next year played Davros oh. so brilliantly you know, for the first time ever, really defined the character. And everyone who's played Davros since has basically tried to emulate Dalek Michael Wisher. Wisher. Yeah. yeah. And he, you know, he did all the Dalek voices. And I think that maybe the modulator effect on it isn't perfect, but Michael had such a Dalek-y voice. Mm. It didn't really matter. Mm. He could get away without a ring modulator, mm. frankly. Well, I will say, you know, I, I actually quite like Death to the Daleks. I, yeah. I, I don't think it's one of the worst Doctor Who stories, but I do think it does have one of the worst Doctor Who cliffhangers of all time. Which, yeah, yeah. Stop, uh, don't move. Stop, don't move. <laughs> which is where the Doctor and Bilal, I think, are, yeah. are walking down a corridor in the Dalek city. They, they stop. And the Doctor says, stop, don't move. And then... <laughs> there's a bit of pattern. And there's some floor. Yeah, there's a bit of pattern floor. Which That's later you discover would electrocute you if you... you do a big, 
jaggedy beam would come down and it's blow you up. It's missing key context in, yeah. that, in the cliffhanger. But you know the reason for it, don't you? It's not meant to be the cliffhanger. That wasn't meant to be yeah. the cliffhanger. As they go into the city, and uh, as before they go into the city, and Bilal, who's a brilliant little character, yeah. isn't he? Little Bilal with the strange lens eyes. Oh, doctor. Um, you know, they're trapped against the wall with two Daleks there. That was meant to be the cliffhanger. Mm. But the timings of the episode were out, and they... They sort of fought to find something that was a cliffhanger yeah. and they failed. Yeah. So instead, we've got a bit of pattern floor and stop, don't move, which is in some way iconic. And a cymbal but... clash as yes. well. And the cymbal clash isn't even by the composer. I think they just took it from a stock record. Right. And they thought, we've got to put something on there. <laughs> Add a bit of drama. It's not in the next episode, the cymbal clash. No. You know? They obviously thought, we'll just forget that happened. Yeah. You know? Nick, you're very passionate. Beth, uh, has, has Nick convinced you should you and Louise just pack up and go home at this point or I'm convinced about the nostalgia because I completely understand that yeah. she's convinced that um, you like it that's yeah, what you're convinced I'm convinced that, that you I'm, absolutely I'm love is it is there a special um, cup for me for that <laughs> yeah, okay. you have made a very convincing case but I do think that my episode is a better pick although mine is a shorter yours is multiple parts whereas mine is just one episode so I can't really speak on cliffhangers and things like that but um no, should I reveal mine? Should okay. I reveal mine now? Let's 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 do it. Beth, in yes. your opinion, what is the best ever Doctor Who story? Well, I was going to pick Love and Monsters. I I would have stormed out right <laughs> this second. Which is controversial. Do you not a, like it? One of the worst episodes. You know when I was talking about terrible episodes? Yeah. Terrible episode. Oh, it's really beautiful, it's, Love and Monsters. I, I love, think it's a yeah. beautiful <laughs> piece of work. <laughs> Maybe because we it's just different. Love you see, Monsters. it does that thing that Doctor Who does, which is Change the format. Divisive, though, that one, right? You, I, I never think you, I realized think that. I only found out about that recently. I think it's Marmite, that one. Off it's the very rails. divisive, and I've always, at first, I think I loved it in a slightly ironic way, but, mm. I've, but actually, I watched it so often that I grew to love it. There was a time when I was much younger where I tweeted the entire script of Love and Monsters because that's, that's how obsessed I was with it. Just line by line. On the, on the 10th anniversary, I literally yeah. line by line tweeted. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a that's, bit strange. That is pretty, <laughs> that's pretty weird, isn't it? So, um, <laughs> well, I love it though. <laughs> yeah, so I was completely head over heels. But there is a story that I have watched quite often recently mm. that I think um, encapsulates everything that I love about Doctor Who, which is Vincent and the Doctor, mm. um, which is a 2010 story written by Richard Curtis um, and it was in series five of Doctor Who. And so I picked that instead because I think that it means much more to me personally mm. and it means a lot to a lot of people in terms of it deals with a lot of themes of about mental health and depression um and it's all about van gogh and his story and i think it's it's a very very beautiful episode of doctor who mm. um i have the nostalgia of watching it you know when i was much younger mm. kind of a teenager kind of a child um and you know it's not very long it doesn't have as many parts as as your choice nick but um i think that that story Obviously, it's amazing that Richard, Cur Richard Curtis wrote it. You know, he's an amazing writer. He wrote Love Actually in lots of very um, famous films. And I think that it's it's something that even if you, you know, I have personal experience with, with mental health struggles, so obviously I really relate to it in that sense. But even if you don't have that and you don't relate to it, you can, I think you can really kind of empathise with Van Gogh's story and with um, the Doctor's relation to that and sort of Amy's sadness that she can't make a difference and things like that in, in there. So, um Yes, I've picked Vincent and the Doctor. I, that is my story. I think it's a strong choice. I mean, <laughs> hard to argue against because I almost picked it. It was. It's <laughs> well, I, mean, top I did three wonder whether you would because I think I saw you tweet about it recently, and I was sort of like, oh my gosh, yeah, I have to fight it out with Vincent and the Doctor. I can't watch the ending of that without crying. I mean, yeah. I yeah. always cry at the right. end of that one. I'm really yeah. sobbing. Yeah, I. I think that final scene mm. with yeah. um, that song by Athlete mm. Mm. called Chances. It's so beautiful and so moving and. I think Doctor Who should make you cry and, and mm, laugh mm. and care so deeply about, it makes you care really deeply about, I guess, especially when I was so young at the time, I think it was my first experience of understanding mental health and mm. depression and yeah. what that means for people. And I think Doctor Who is, as it, as it always was, so good at educating people on, on subjects mm. such as this one. Um, and there are, there are other Doctor Who stories that deal with mental health stuff and sort of the hope and the, you know, behind everything as well. But um, I think I'd say the that the whole one. thing about mental health issues is that, you know, uh, me too. And uh, Doctor Who has, was my saviour as a child, really, with all sorts of, you know, again, I can't pay my therapist for this, <laughs> but, you know, uh, all sorts of issues I had. And I've realised only relatively recently mm -hmm. how Doctor Who was my saviour because of the mental health issues I was suffering and continue to suffer with. Yeah. Although I would say, you know, the ending 
how can it be as moving as the melting of the polystyrene city on Exelon? <laughs> well, I mean, come on, guys. Look, that sequence is beautiful, but does it have Dalek saxophones? <laughs> yeah. I mean. Does it have pop music? It's, it's always good it to get some funny little little <laughs> noises that a couple of the cast members who visited the dubbing session just yeah. did, you know, improvise. Uh, Louise. Two very strong pitches. What well, strong um, pitch? I mean, from... were they? Do you really like that? Well, a, strong, a, strong, a strong pitch from Beth and a, and a pitch from Nick. An interesting pitch. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> an honest pitch. Yeah. Have, have either of those uh, swayed you, or are you, are you sticking to your guns with your pick for the best ever Doctor Who story? I'm definitely sticking to my pick. I mean, Nick, it somewhat felt like you've kind of Stockholm syndromed yourself into that one just by having <laughs> listened to it so much. I wonder yeah, yeah. if that's at play. I here. think that's <laughs> accurate. My yeah, favourite yeah. bit about Nick's story was that he uh, liked the theme tune and then discovered that there were some good bits in between. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 that, that is the stuff in the sounds quite good as well. <laughs> Precisely what happened. <laughs> and 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 Beth, I love I love Vince and the Doctor so much, but. I have to say, a bit, bit of a forgettable monster for yeah. Doctor Who. Mm. We, we have I to disagree. Say. Rubbish, I think, is the word we'd like to <laughs> say. I yeah. disagree. I love that it's an invisible <laughs> monster. I mean, yeah, it kind of looks a bit like a turkey, but, yeah. you know, I love that it's invisible. I love that it has this kind of weird so is story. It a turkey of, or is it invisible? Which is it? It's, it's, an invis it's, it's an invisible turkey. <laughs> How do you know it's a turkey? <laughs> no, no, I remember. I think Death of the Daleks is the turkey. That's yeah. the word oh! Um, or the, the root monster. <laughs> yeah. The CGI hasn't quite lived up to a to the last when did it air? 13 years yeah. um which is probably quite a good thing that it's not really on screen that often but i i think that it's i think it's quite cute i think that it's quite cute you know when we do see it i think it's executed well i think it's just poor design a poor design choice i would say yeah yeah oh but i, I think when i think of it i just think of van gogh's painting mm. of the Gfers, oh. and then i just yeah van gogh's <laughs> painting of the Gfers. um and i think I, I love the painting and that makes me love the design. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So you, you're slagging off Van Gogh if you... If yeah, you sorry, like sorry. Yeah, well, <laughs> this is what works. What's he going to bring it on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's he going to do? Well, Cut another ear off. No, sorry. <laughs> so Louise, then, in that case, in your opinion, what is the best ever Doctor Who story? Uh, for me, it had to come down to series one of New Who, episode six, Dalek. I agree. How can you argue against that, Nick? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know how to argue with that. <laughs> it's for me it's so it's it's simple but it's beautiful in its simplicity i think if rose showed that doctor who can kind of work in the 21st century dalek showed it can thrive it's just it's beautiful in every sense it's chris eccleston at his best if i'm anything i'm a chris eccleston girl but even anyone who's not i don't think you can deny how brilliant he is in that episode how brilliant billy piper is like you were saying, Nick, the companion in this episode. I thought you were going to say how brilliant Nick is, and you just glossed past that. <laughs> how brilliant Nick is. Give her a chance. The voice of the Daleks. I will come to it. <laughs> um, Rose is amazing. I think mm. it's one of the first mm. times we see her fully as the driving force behind an episode. She really saves the Doctor from himself. Mm. Um, we see, you know, the Doctor's triumph, his cruelty, his joy, his protectiveness. Um, and it's all kind of done in this one location with one Dalek and it's just simple at its best. It's just everything that's brilliant about Doctor Who, I think. Oh, that, I really want to thank you for choosing that because it was such a hugely important experience in my life to do it. And, and yeah, I, I, of course, I, during, it, during the post-production stage, I watched it so mm. many times and have watched it lots of times since, of course. And uh, yeah. And it is, and the whole reason Doctor Who kept going is because of the Dalek. So I think that's really fitting. You know, Doctor Who really started being Doctor Who when that story, the Daleks, happened. You know, mm. that defined what Doctor Who was about. You know, Perry Nation defined the tone of Doctor Who in a way. And that's a, uh, yeah. And I think yourself and Russell kind of updated them in such a masterful way. Like it. I think the Daleks, um, they've always been a little bit funny as well as being a little yeah. bit scary. And, and they kept that brilliantly. Um, you both updated it to, to still be a bit scary. There's that brilliant bit with, um, with the stairs where it's like, stairs won't defeat a Dalek anymore. <laughs> you know, you say elevate and it's yeah. like, oh my God, what is happening? Um, yeah, it's yeah. brilliant. And I think it's the perfect way to kind of update a classic monster, the most iconic monster. Yeah. Did you have discussions, Nick, about that because there's far more emotion in that Dalek yeah. than we've mm. ever heard. Before. No, absolutely. Yeah. Russell said to me, look, we know you can do the classic Dalek. He said, push the envelope. Uh, you know, you can be more expressive. You know, just right from that first scene where it's going, yeah, stop it, hey, as opposed to just, ah, stop it, you know mm. what I mean? He wanted it to, um, 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know whether it's true. Russell will tell me if he sees this. Um, that I think at the last minute, I think he suddenly had this worry. I can't, we're putting this speak your wake machine on Saturday nights on television prime time and people are just going to laugh it off the screen. So mm. he thought it must, it must be much more than that. Mm. And Joe Ahern kept saying to me, he was the director, uh, kept saying to me when Rose was doing those intimate scenes with the Daleks, he, he, you've probably heard me say this a million times, he'd run back and say to me, make her cry, make her cry. Mm. And it did work, you know, and I started to be ultra pathetic and uh, Billy Piper, whoop, the tears started going, you know. How do you feel about making Billy Piper cry? Oh, well, was <laughs> Terrible man. <laughs> And it was such a lovely process of rehearsal as well, yeah. you know, and uh, Christopher Eccleston took me off into the dark uh, corridors of the Millennium Centre where we were filming. And he said, can you come, can you go through the scene with me? And he just took me to this strange area, which I never saw again, funnily enough. But um, yeah, and took me through the scene, acting at full power at me with me just sitting there reading the script, you know, because, you know, spoiler alert, I don't learn it. As I, uh, <laughs> or you mind you, yeah, by the end of the scene, I know it because yeah. I've done it so many times. Yeah, we really wanted to make it different. And everyone was so thrilled with the Dalek and the design and everything. It's, uh, but that thing you say about Daleks, you know, being sort of funny, it's an essential part of the kind of British way of dealing with villains. Mm -hmm. You know, we, you know, like, you know, the, the, the leader of the Third Reich, we, we characterized him as a funny little man with mm -hmm. a moustache and ridiculous. And I think that's an important thing about a, a, an evil being. There has to be a way in which it's also ludicrous. Yeah, I think they even say in the episode, they refer to it as a rusty tin robot, which, you know, it is what it is. But it's yeah. also absolutely terrifying, especially to, you know, a child watching it yeah. on a Saturday night. It's dark outside. And Russell always made sure with his Dalek stories that there was always some extra element. Mm. You know, the, the next time round, it was a real sort of action story, but they had the Emperor mm. Dalek mm. and those big sort of booming, you know, quasi-religious statements about how he, I, well, it's not quasi-religious, he says, I am the god of all Daleks, mm. you know. So there was always something, all of the writers have done it, actually, there's always something different and interesting about the Daleks, rather than just using them as a mindless army. Mm. Well, Radio Time's audience have also been having their say on this one. So Amy on X, uh, she was backing World Enough in Time and The Doctor Falls. Uh, Jodie B voted for Heaven Sent. Uh, and Eni was pushing for the caves of Androzani, uh, mm. so a little bit of classic series representation there. Uh, on Facebook, Nikita Carter voted for Blink, which I feel like we might get a bit of stick. No one, no one said Blink, which is often <laughs> a popular choice. And Heaven Sent, that's massively popular. Yeah, yeah just I think recently just well, topped a Doctor Who magazine yeah. magazine yeah. poll. Uh, Aaron Smith voted for the Seeds of Doom, which I, I do love the Seeds amazing, of Doom. It's amazing. great. Uh, Phoebe Stocks said uh, the Five Doctors, which which is a lot. It's a lot of fun yes. that one, uh, but. It does fall upon me to make the ultimate difficult choice. Nick, you argued that Death to the Daleks was the best ever Doctor Who story. Beth, you were convinced that Vincent and the Doctor deserved the top spot. And Louise, you were backing Dalek as the number one favourite. So I've listened to your arguments, I've considered all the evidence. And I have to say, like, I think, Louise, actually, you made me kind of reappraise Dalek a little bit. Like, I, lo I, I love that episode, but I can see you're, you're so passionate about it. Nick, I can tell how much Death to the Daleks <laughs> means to you, and, I, and I'm glad. But, it is, but it is, is it really the best ever Doctor Who story? I'm glad, I'm glad you love it. I'm glad you love it. But I, I don't feel patronised at all. <laughs> I feel I'm fine with that. I'm happy for you. But I have to say, I think, Beth, you spoke really wonderfully about Vincent and the Doctor, and I think of the three episodes on offer here, I think Vincent and the Doctor <laughs> is possibly the most important piece of television and probably just one of the most important pieces of television one of the most important episodes that doctor who has ever produced so the best ever doctor who story is officially vincent and the doctor beth you are today's winner yeah I took well, well done to the turkey well done well done to the turkey yeah, I feel amazing about winning. I don't know if I won because Morgan really loves Vincent and the Doctor or because I made a very good debate for it, but I'm very excited that I've won and I get this beautiful, heavy, best ever trophy. I felt like I came third, really, as opposed to even second. But here's the thing, I'm really not a competitive person and I think I self-sabotaged. <laughs> and Death to the Daleks, I love Death to the Daleks, but I never expected anyone else to think it was the best Doctor Who story ever. I can appreciate Vincent and the Doctor being picked, to be honest, it's top three for me, so I'm a bit broken hearted, but not, not entirely, it's all right. <laughs> 
Uh, Nick, Beth, Louise, before you all dematerialize, just leaves me to say uh, thank you very much for joining me on the panel. Uh, and thank you all for joining us as well. Uh, what did you think of the verdict? And what do you think is the best ever Doctor Who story? You can let us know uh, on X at Radio Times. We'll be bringing you new episodes of the best ever weekly. So be sure to head to radiotimes.com forward slash the best ever for all the latest news and additional exclusive content from each new episode. If you're listening to the podcast, you can also subscribe and review the best ever on your podcast outlet of choice. That's all for now. We'll see you soon with more of the best ever.